Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a special edition of our Talking Cloud podcast. I'm really excited to have a bunch of folks with us today from AWS, and we're going to spend the entire episode just talking about Gen AI. So we're going to forget all the AWS updates okay. this week and just spend 45-ish minutes uh, on Gen AI. So welcome, everybody. And uh, for our friends that are joining us from AWS today, we have this sort of unofficial tradition. I don't even know how it actually started at this point. Uh, Travers and I, I guess Travers and I would always sort of just pass movie recommendations back and forth in Slack. And it was just like, well, how do we start the podcast? So we started talking about movies. So what I'm going to do is ask that uh, Deborshi, Gerardo, you both introduce yourselves. And during your introduction, what we'd like to know is something that you're watching. Okay. Uh, a recommendation. Okay. It could be something that's actually worthwhile. But uh, what Travers and I have found is a lot of times we we share movies that are just so bad that you, you actually have to watch them because they're so bad, they're just good. So, Dvorshi, can I ask you <laughs> to, uh, to get us started? Sure, okay. Well, I'll start with the intro. Uh, well, I'm Dvorshi Chaudhary. I'm a senior partner solutions architect at AWS out of Toronto. And the role of a PSA or a, solution, a partner solutions architect is... Uh, managing the technical relationships between partners, customers, and of course, AWS. We kind of help partners in developing AWS practices, enablement, workshops, ideations, build technical solutions together, just to drive the business outcomes uh, for our customers. And fun fact for the viewers, uh, Brett and I go uh, more than 10 years now, I guess, Brett, right? Wow. Yeah, we worked in a previous organization together and uh, in fact, uh, he's the one who inspired me to start looking at the cloud. And uh, we did a couple of projects together. Oh, you know, <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, about movie recommendation. I don't watch much movies, uh, but uh, not lately. Uh, but I do. Uh, All time favorite is what I would say. Uh, it, it's a Shawshank Redemption. I, I love that movie. Oh. Every time it. It's it's on TV. I'm going to watch it uh, regardless. Like uh, I don't know, it's something about that movie that inspires me a lot. Yeah, I, really I, yeah, good choice. I'm 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 with you on that one. If that movie's on, I'm going to watch it. And uh, I couldn't imagine how many times I've probably watched that movie. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, really good. Thanks, Borshi. Uh Gerardo, how about you? Yep, sure. So my name is Gerardo Vasquez. I am also senior partner solution architect at AWS, also based out in Toronto. I mean the same thing as the Barshi. So we are doing just the same, helping system integrators to become successful and create new practice, for example, generative AI, machine learning, DevOps. And at the end, it's what we are looking is always to foster some successful business. So outside of work, I enjoy spending time with my wife and playing soccer, or in this case, tennis. So we have been playing tennis for the last two or three weeks. Oh, nice. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Recommendation. So, I have been watching some, a new series called Shogun. So, really good. It's from the, the old age in, in Japan. So, you can see a lot of uh, action. So, gotcha. yeah, I would say it's a good series to start watching if you want something different. Yeah. Very well, good. Awesome. I've heard I'll good things about that, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Travers. Everybody knows Travers already. We're so far into to the, you know, our podcasting adventure episodes. here. Right? It's 18, yeah. So Travers, uh, how about movie recommendation? Something you're watching or something you plan on watching? Uh, well, movie recommendations. Uh, I can not recommend Sherlock Gnomes. Do not watch it. It's not, <laughs> it's not worth your time. <laughs> yeah. uh, for stuff I'm actually watching, <laughs> I just finished. Uh, don't ask why we watch that. Uh, I can't explain it. Uh, but we just finished Fallout, so uh, that was uh, that was great. That was well worth the watch. Yeah, yeah. We just finished Fallout too. I'm a little disappointed. Uh, both my wife and I were like, "How is that only eight episodes? Like they could have made that yeah a lot longer." And and I I would have really enjoyed it, but uh, we'll have to see what happens in season two, right? So okay, yeah. great. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna also a couple little caretaking things. Yesterday, we were prepping for this, and my phone rang. So the good news is that I've left the phone. I double-checked. There's no phone here. But you'll notice I have a friend who, who snuck in here uh, before I got started. 
So we may actually be interrupted by a cat at some point. Uh, and if he does that, we'll we'll take a quick break and uh, get rid of him. That's and then fun. on the movie side, I don't really have a movie recommendation this month, this week. But I, I do sort of suggest if you're into kind of scary movies, horror movies, which I don't really think they truly make anymore, uh, check out Shudder. We, we, my wife and I have been trying it out. And uh, I'll be frank, there's some really horrible stuff on on that streaming network but as i said it's Perfect. it's so horrible it's it's actually kind of fun to watch so if you're looking for something new there's there's some interesting things okay. on that show on that streaming platform all right okay. so with with all the fun out of the way let's let's jump in let's start talking about some gen ai things uh Deborshi, i'm gonna ask you to get us kicked off here and obviously as we're going through the conversation folks uh, just Feel free to chime in at any moment. You know, the, the more input, the better here. But uh, Deborshi, my, my first question is really around the differences between Gen AI and traditional AI. Can you kind of just explain to us what the difference between those two two technologies, two terms might be? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, the, you know, when you say traditional AI, it sounds like it has been there. And long forgotten sort of thing. It's not the case, but yeah. So traditional AI models are very task specific, right? They're trained on smaller uh, task specific data sets. Uh, these right. models are pretty much relying on label data. So I would say 99% of them are based on supervised learning where the desired outputs are already provided during the training process. Uh, so you probably heard of a lot of these algorithms already. A lot of them have using it, linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, and all those kinds, right? Uh, and, and they're very well suited for, you know, classification, regression, or clustering type of use case. And just to give more context to our viewers who are, uh, who are tuned in, it's, it's where, let's say you receive an email, and uh, sometimes you probably would have seen it in Google as well, you know, it's, email has been marked as spam. So is that a spam or not? So identifying those, sure. classifying those, right? Uh, then they're also used a lot in the healthcare and life sciences as well. Like, you know, you predict whether a patient with a given set of symptoms, do they have a specific disease or not sort of thing, right? And all those things. On the linear regression or regression kind, you're kind of predicting, let's say, uh, house pricing for a particular zip code, you give some, you know, data points to that. You do the feature engineering. What are the data points that you think are more relevant? Let's say square footage of a house, location, uh, how many garages do that, does it have? Right. So all those kind of things. So that's about the traditional, it's mostly about predicting things. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And on the generative side, uh, the way the generative AI learns about the, uh, you know, the information or generate new contents is by under, you know, understanding the underlying structure of the data and the patterns within the data. And, you know, we have seen pretty much image generation. We have seen so many use cases. We are seeing, you know, code whisperer where the code is getting generated for you, uh, text generation, even music composition. And kind of model pretty available, right? So primarily they're based on generating new content is what I would say when it comes to generating uh, generative AI. And for traditional AI, it's more about making predictions or classifying. So, yeah. Very good. Thanks for clarifying that for us. Uh, I guess that the next thing that we really wanted to dive into today was obviously real world examples of how organizations might be using mm -hmm. Gen AI because in our conversations with our customers, I think a lot of times, and you know, Travers, let me know if you think the same thing, but we have some general questions from customers about this, but a lot of times it's what I, what I classify as shoulder shrugging, like, well, like, where do we right. start? We don't know what we don't know. How do we get started? So what, what are some mm. examples of you know, how organizations are, are using Gen AI right now, whether it's proof of concepts, whether it's things that they're actually running in production. Can you give us any sense of what people are doing? Yeah, the, um, absolutely. Like, uh, but yeah, addressing your point about the proof of concept, uh, uh, at least here in Canada, uh, 
I would say initially about a year, year and a half ago, we started with our customers doing a lot of proof of concept and it was very generalized sort of things, but uh, it kind of evolved within a few months and we are seeing very focused uh, approach from our customers and moving away from proof of concept to actually productionizing those uh, use cases. Uh, but I would share a few of the public use cases. Those are already there, uh, not necessarily out of Canada, but uh, in, in general. Uh, so uh, LexisNexis is one of the data analytics company. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but I've used them in the past, uh, especially you know when I actually bought my place. Uh, I put in the zip code and wanted to understand, you know, the crime rate and all those things. They do a lot of those analytics as well. I just wanted to see which neighborhood I'm going to buy, right? So I had a few places that I bid yeah. for and I put that data in, those zip codes, just, you know, postal codes, just to understand, like, you know, wherever I'm going to be moving in, uh, what was the crime rate and all. And they do those kind of analytics. Anyway, the, the, the solution this Lexus Nexus has done is it's called a Lexus Plus AI platform. They're actually based on a finely tuned uh, Claw 2 model on Amazon Bedrock. And uh, this platform is actually built for lawyers or at least helping uh, people in, you know, you know, from the law side to help them uh, search information or do summarizations or make intelligent legal drafting capabilities uh, and helping the lawyers to increase their productivity. So the, the idea is to increase efficiency and productivity of these lawyers. So that's one of the use cases by Alexa. Uh, the other one that I really enjoy a lot is, is, is booking.com. Uh, you know, uh, they are using a fine tuned version of a language models on Amazon bedrock. And, uh, uh, what they do is they actually create a tailored recommendations for a destination and accommodations and such. And I, I don't know about you guys, but to be honest, like, I mean, when I book my vacations, uh, uh, all of vacations, uh, uh, you know, going for a vacation is such a, a great thing. But before all the logistics part of it, where I'm going to stay, you yeah. know, which place is going to be a better, you know, in terms of staying or food or, you know, what I'm going to eat, what are the places which is not that touristy enough so that I can, you know, find some time be with the nature, be with, you know, uh, you know, be with the local culture. And uh, it's hard for me. Uh, it's a lot of Google search, which is what I used to do in the past. But now having this in your booking system where you can set up your preferences and you're having almost a personal agent, a travel agent, helping you with that itinerary that you built for your vacation. I think that's powerful. Uh, I mean, I love that. What about you guys? Like, uh, you, you guys have anything yeah. to? Well, yeah, I will... oh, go ahead, Robert. Really? Go ahead. And I will say yes, I love that. So usually you need to investigate a lot of time, and yeah. Yeah. Imagine, you at least can start with, already with that. And also, I remember also a use case for retailers. So imagine a retail that they have a lot of items, they have a physical stores, and they want to mm -hmm. position their items to their customers so uh, the sellers they cannot go through all the items and descriptions so with generative ai they go and create a custom script depending on the retail location and they can identify what are the advantage of that specific item versus the competent so they can do okay. that specific custom script and speech for the customers in just one second pretty good it's really, yeah, really interesting. All those examples kind of tie back to RAG or uh, retrieval augmented generation applications, right? Where you have a tuned system that has a data set that'll go back and augment the experience. So I, I think that's, that's really interesting to see. I'm kind of curious about how maybe, how do you think these kinds of Gen AI systems can help organizations improve their products or services? Uh, I guess that's one way to do it. Are there, is there anything else that you guys, that comes to mind? Yeah. So, I mean, there are various approaches uh, for tuning these models and making it much more customized and, you know, be much more relevant. There are uh, different approaches, you could say, depending on the kind of model that you're also using in the first place. Uh, you know, right. the RAG approach, as you mentioned, then you have the fine-tuned version of it. And Amazon Bedrock re really makes it 
very easy for you to deploy these language models. Use services like Knowledge Base to do the rag part of it, where you feed the model with your set of data. And if you want to even fine tune the model or do a continuous pre training of a model, you can do that too. So, uh, in, in short, I would say, you know, there are different approaches to make this model much more uh, relevant and specific to your use case. But what I feel is, uh, these models are really helping us with productivity in any products or services that you go. And coming from, you know, engineering development background, uh, you know, software development comes to my mind right away, right? And globally, we have seen pretty much almost, uh, I'm not sure if there's a number, but pretty much every industry is reliant on software in some shape or form, right? And products like uh, Amazon Code Whisper or Amazon Q4 Builders, you know, using large language models under the hood uh, are assisting developers to create code, debug their code, identify any kind of vulnerabilities or bugs in it, create those test things, streamline, streamlining the entire, you know, end-to-end -end development lifecycle of an SDLC lifecycle, right? So I, I think productivity is a huge one for me. And, and, I, and I think uh, this is only going to get better over time uh, as we have more advances in these models. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll mention. I'll, you, you mentioned something there that that I really enjoy is the the Q piece of it. Q for Builder, I think they're calling it now. Um, you know, I I often describe it now as as a companion. There's a, a good book mm -hmm. that Travers and I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, and again, the name is slipping my mind right now. Uh, I'll share it in the in the notes after the fact. But he the author kind of talks about this idea of just sort of inviting AI into the things that you're doing as a way to learn about it, understand its capabilities, understand its limitations. And you know, Q, Q for Builder or Q Builders, whatever you're going to call it now, is kind of a great example of that. And, and it's been a, a really important, very quickly become an important part of my daily workflow in, in an IDE, in the, the console. And what I found is just, you were talking about sort of saving time and improving productivity and things like that. You know, just the idea of, of not having to uh, switch context, right? I'm, I'm working on something in my IDE before I'd have to go up and, you know, go and open a browser tab, do some searching, find something that's relevant. And now I can simply stay in the IDE and ask that question to Q and get an answer back. And another thing that Travers and I talk about all the time is trust, but verify. So the hallucinations and stuff like mm -hmm. that still yeah. happen, but still just yeah, you, you, you want to check that, right, to make sure it's true and, and it's going to do what you want. But the productivity gains there by not having to switch context or, or go off and use a different tool, I think, is, uh, is pretty amazing. And, yeah, and pretty I lose my, you know, yeah, and I, I would say, like, you know, uh, th that's the biggest point, right? I mean, as the, you just hit the nail on this, uh, Brett, because for me, when I start digging into something that I'm looking into, I might just lose my concentration. I might get into a rabbit hole of maybe some YouTube video oh, yeah. and end up being, seeing some dogs and cats in the video, right? So keeping that focus on, like, and that's what I do. Like, it's like so well, well, I'm not that like, you know, So it happens with me. So having that integration of the language model, which is not only helping you with the productivity, but, you know, keeping you kind of, honed into what you're doing as a task. I think that is uh, huge for me in terms of productivity, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Travers, were you going to, were you going to say something there? I was just saying like the, the hit rate is not, it's, it's pretty good with these co-pilots and they're, they're so impactful for every task you might want to do in an IDE, right? Like in that environment. Um, yeah, no, we use them all the time. I'm going to share a couple of links here. I'm having some, uh, technology issues here. So just bear with me a second. Gerardo, anything as yeah. I'm trying to make this work? Anything you want to share? There we go. Uh, probably it's already as mentioned. Uh, when you want to have a task and you are not feeling comfortable, uh, you don't need to do this by yourself. So that's why uh, generative AI is use cases on be even a body to do this onboarding with you. That could be really helpful because you won't have, for example, the bar sheet always on my shoulder or next to me to ask that question. So you can do that question too, that uh, 
chatbot, intelligent chatbot companion, as you mentioned, and have a really fast response right away. Yeah, yeah and even it's like having your own divorce. Yeah, in yeah, it is. In it's my divorce, kind of, that's yeah. the important. <laughs> yeah. The Dworshi that never has to sleep, uh, never, never at least uh, admits to you that he thinks your question is dumb. Just, just answers it, right? Uh, that's that's always good. I shared a link. We, you know, speaking of of Q, we did a whole series of videos, and there's a, a blog post about it now. Sort of our first impressions of Amazon Q as a as a AI assistant, and I shared a link to that to the website. I mentioned already just how much I see this being the future. And the other comment from that book that I often think about now is you, you often have to sort of always think about the AI you're using right now is going to be the worst right. AI that you've ever used. Like it's always just going to be incrementally improving. And, uh, you know, where I'm always posting things on LinkedIn about just the other day, I was trying to figure out something with CloudFront and you got a load balancer sitting in front of cloud or sorry, the other way around CloudFront sitting in front of your load balancer. And I'm like, I know I need to change the security group on the load balancer to allow that traffic mm -hmm. from CloudFront. But for the life of me, I could not remember what I needed to do for that. And in in the old days, what I would have to do is open up my favorite search engine, you know, probably s s get through a bunch of articles to find the real thing. And I threw it in queue and it gave me the uh, the correct answer. I was able to verify it and make that change really quickly. So it's it's fantastic. I guess the other thing is you mentioned just in passing, just because we're talking about sort of this I idea of AI assistance is is code whisperer. And I know there's there's other solutions mm -hmm. out there too, but it I think when when we first started trying code whisperer out, my comment to Travers was this thing is slightly scary in the fact that it's like almost reading your mind as you're working on something and it's kind of working ahead of you and, and populating. Was it always right? No, it goes back to the hallucinations thing again, but just the, the idea of being able to um, have that right there to make you a little more efficient, a little more um, productive, I think both Q and, and, and Code Whisper or any yeah. other tool you might be using would be fantastic for that or, or are fantastic for that. Very good. Yeah. That's what excites me the most, productivity. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I've been chatting away, guys, and I've totally lost where I am in my little cheat sheet. So, uh, Travers, see yeah. here. Where are we? All right. Okay. I think uh, next thing, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about uh, as AWS inside Google, do you have any thoughts about how people are using this technology to uh, save money, particularly in like an enterprise context? Like, there's a lot of efficiency gains here, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, uh, I would say. You know, there are different approaches to it. Uh, everybody is using it in a different way. But uh, I, uh, I think productivity is what comes to my mind pretty much all right. the time. And of course, there are other use cases to it as well. Like, you know, as you mentioned, as a companion, as a, you know, a, a knowledge base or, a, or could be an onboarding buddy for somebody who got hired into the company newly. And you have to go through 10 different insight, uh, you know, links to get them onboarded. And all those things. So there are different things, but I think in the nutshell, it all comes down to the productivity and uh, automating those repetitive tasks, uh, or even building rapid products or services, uh, doing prototypes. Uh, even if you are creating a product where you want to do some testing, you can create and generate synthetic data to do those kind of testings as well. If you know, oh, sure. so there's so much happening, right? So um, yeah. you know, your the, the idea behind this is not. You know, of course, the productivity is one part of it. Uh, the other part that I can think of that comes to my mind is like they can go to such huge, large volume of data to uncover those valuable insights from it. it I, I think that is powerful for a business. Like if you really have to dig into so much data from a business perspective, you want to figure out your customer feedback, you want to figure out the market trends, your product reviews, you can feed in. Uh, these models with that amount of data from every you know source that you have, and this model can augment and help you make better decisions over time. And again, I, I think that that can save you money, that can save you time, and that can increase productivity. So in general, I, I think uh, I think that is 
that is something where we are seeing it's going. And, and I think it's one of the uh, publicly, uh, you know, I, I think by Goldman Sachs that they released the analysts from there, they released that within the next decade, within the next 10 years, there would be about $7 trillion uh, included in the GDP because of generative AI. So which means it's, you right. know, it's going to help us increase the productivity and all this business insight in such a profound way then we will add $7 trillion to the global GDP. So, gotcha. which is huge. Yeah. I, I guess it's kind of less about efficient, more about like increasing the baseline skill level of people, right? Like that kind of augments you in a way that you're much more efficient with a much exactly. lower starting floor, right? Um, exactly. I think we were, I think, Brent, yeah, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but there was that one study, uh, the Harvard study about consultants who got access to gen ai and across the board you saw performance gains um but you saw the biggest gains amongst people who started the lowest but also were taught how to use the tools effectively so that's where you saw the biggest boost um i guess the other question i have then is what's the kind of what kind of skills should organizations look for or look to get into for gen ai yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I think uh, it's it's important for every, you know for us to address uh, for everybody actually because in, in a traditional sense, in a traditional AI specialized machine learning skill sets and knowledge was needed. A lot of them we have seen in the past comes from PhDs and such from a traditional sense who right. you know who are writing these algorithms, looking into it, looking into the data, you know. So those kind of specialized skill set was needed, but the focus is kind of shifting, and especially Amazon uh, and AWS is helping, you know, just re democratized, you know, uh, infrastructure with cloud and services that we evolved. And I think that's going to happen the same when it comes to generative AI as well. So with, so this is what I'm saying with the generative models, you know, you have developers, software engineers who can build smarter applications and services and solutions without needing to know how these models are actually trained, uh, without needing to know how to train these models from scratch. You can actually call the Amazon Bedrocks API, use a model which is, you know, something very competent or very specific to the use case that you're building. You know, each of these models will have different flavors to it. Right. Few are good in summarization, good in writing, code. Some are really very creative, depending on your use case. So you will use these models. So as a software developer and as an engineer, all you do is just invoke through the API, Amazon Bedrock, and call an underlying model and augment your uh, application with uh, with a smarter response or this, you know, with some kind of a smart way to to access the data sources and orchestrate that. And and create those solutions uh, for the customers, right? And I, I and I think that's where it is going. You don't necessarily have to be a, in a traditional sense a machine learning expert anymore, and, and, right. and you can just be a software developer, indie, uh, or some model. Yeah, yeah, um, I th that's really powerful. Yeah, I was going to say sorry to yeah, you. and I. And I was just going to say, like, I, I think the okay. the big thing there was what you said right at the end about not needing to understand the the complexity of the underlying machine learning piece. Like, right. like what, what you're doing here is the you abstract. use the term demo, demo, I, don't, I always think about it, the original democratization. <laughs> democratization. There you go. I always think about the original thing. I don't know if Amazon uses it anymore, but just like shifting the undifferentiated heavy lifting, the complex stuff. Let Amazon worry about that. And, and then to your point, Deborshi, like how do we how do we use these tools that have been made easier for us to use to build better applications, build better services, and deliver those applications and services to our customers faster than we could right. uh, if if we had to build all of this sort of from from the bottom up, right? I think that's really important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And probably you got to see how this knowledge is become more and more frequent to the people and also you know, going to start having mm -hmm. these new uh, knowledge requests when you go in deep, for example, how to start getting more from the LLMs So how to do prompting, how to do uh, fine-tuning, how to make the best rack, 
So all of those kind of skills is going to start bringing up and be more common. But democratic, uh, having this initial conversation of how to use uh, generative AI, it's something that now it's in all the applications also. So it's really it's cool to see how is this changing also in the technology. Yeah, you said something yeah. interesting there, Gerardo, about the, the prompting. And Travers and I have talked about this a couple times on, on the on the podcast is that the importance of actually being able to properly frame your question uh, because mm-hmm. you know the old saying garbage in garbage out which really these yep. these these LLMs they're they're mm-hmm. not it's they're not smart right what they're doing is they're they're predicting an answer based on sort of what the most common sort of tokens or or the way things are it's like the relationships here between these words and and being able to frame a question in, in the pro like have the right context is going to be so important because if you ask a bad question you're going to get a bad answer um yep. I, I think that prompt engineering thing is going to be incredibly important and we've kind of made fun of it a little bit i think travers uh, yes, on sure. on previous episodes but like the more i think about it the the more just in my own experimentation yeah. and learning is if I ask it a bad question, I'm not going to get a great answer. And then I have to go back and forth and, and continually kind of fine tune that prompt. Yeah. It's kind of an essential part of leveraging these chat tools properly. Right. Thankfully, uh, it seems like, uh, if you move to like a more managed service kind of, uh, deployment for this, you can kind of abstract that away too, a little bit on the back end. Um, yeah. Kind of, it just kind of makes me think though, if I'm someone who's looking to get started with mm-hmm. more of uh, on AWS with some kind of Gen AI service, um, what's the, what's the best way to, uh, get started with that? So, well, if, if you, so I would say you have to look into it from the customer's perspective, like uh, your persona. So if you are, mm. so. Let me go back a little. So at, at a very high level within AWS, we have identified like sort of like three layers of stacks, you could call it that way. So the bottom layer kind of has the machine learning frameworks, all the underlying infrastructure that you would need. Uh, you know, it, it, it can be frameworks like uh, uh, PyTorch and such, uh, you know, uh, our Inferentia chipset silicon that we have for, you know, inference, uh, training for training these models and such. And so you have, this is where uh, the, the model providers will be using these ML frameworks and those infrastructure to build a model, train the model from scratch sort of thing, right? And on the middle layer is where we have our tools and services uh, and services like Amazon Bedrock, which actually abstracts away that underlying infrastructure for you and provides you with a very, you know, easy to use API where you can invoke your models, uh, fine tune your models, customize your models and use your models in your application. And now at the topmost layer, we are building applications which leverages these machine learning models or other large language models under the hood for you. And something like Code Whisper, right. we talked about something like Amazon Q for builders. So depending on your persona, if you are a consumer who, you know, a business user uh, who wants uh, off the shelf kind of almost like a product sort of thing, which has uh, large language models baked into it for whatever task that they're doing. So you would go at the top most layer with Amazon Q for builders or for business or code whispers and such. If you're a builder, software engineer, developer who would build these modern applications and products and services, uh, then you probably almost use the middle layer, which is bedrock and a sage right. to some extent. But, but uh, if you are a model provider, you know, Know, like Anthropic or Cohere and all these guys or Hugging right. Face, you will end up using the bottommost layer to train and build your model from scratch. I think you'll be rolling your own training architecture with EC2 oh. or, or containers, yeah. something like that. Yeah, container. Yeah. Yeah. And also something important is that even though there are these three layers, you can always move a, to the top of the stack or go to the bottom. So you can start with Amazon oh, Q, sure. depending on your needs. Uh, if you see that your uh, already use case is complex enough, then 
go in deep into the mill layer, start using, in this case, Petro, modify some of the parameters of fine tuning, start having these wire rails, and finally, depending on the size of the organization, they can start doing the part of the first layer that it's going to be more for the design. So uh, it's yeah. up to you in which layer you are going to be, and you can always combine and mix and match. I think I think what you have to do here is again just not be afraid to experiment and try some mm. things out. Kind of to to your point, Gerardo, like you might have to kind of experiment a little bit to figure out the layer that for what you're trying to do. Is it a top yeah. layer kind of thing? Is it at the very bottom, the foundation? Like where should we actually be building this solution? And I think the only way you're really going to know that is to start building some things, testing some things. Uh, trying to figure out how all of this stuff works for your particular use case. And then eventually what you're going to do is you're going to, you know, the, the first word that comes to my mind is stumble, but that, that sounds like you're just kind of, well, you're not really planning, but you know what I mean? Like a lot of times you are going to kind of, as you experiment with these things, find that yes. spot and, and where it makes a lot of sense. That's one of the things that I loved about Q. Like, you know, as you're just getting started, the series of, of blog posts that I mentioned earlier on or YouTube videos, like I was amazed at what we could do in two Twitch sessions and have oh, yeah. that thing up and running with a, a chat bot uh, ready to go. And we could have it pulling in some of our own custom data sources, like the, the articles we have on the website, the website pages. Yeah, yeah. And, and we tied it to our Slack channel and to be able to just then run some I'll call it queries, but ask questions about it and to see what you could do in a very short period of time. Pretty mind blowing. I think that kind of goes back to your earlier comments to Borshi about just being able to get these things up and running very quickly and get those exactly. products or services out there, right? And start experimenting with yeah. them. Yeah. 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 Oh, and uh, I found, I, I fixed my little technical issue and, and Travers, I found that article that you mentioned a while ago about the Harvard oh, did study. You? Yeah. And I put it in chat. Oh, like yeah. I said, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I put it in the, um, in the show notes as well, because it, it was a really interesting conversation. And I think it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. Like starting to build solutions here is, is the most important part because even those folks with, let's say the lower level on the, on the skill spectrum would be immediately more productive and more efficient with these types of, of, tools or companions to help them in their environment. And that, that uh, blog post is, is really quite interesting to read. So I'll make sure I share that. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, this, this is all great stuff, but we, we do have to talk about the sort of the flip side of this. It's great to say, mm -hmm. Hey, just get out there and experiment and, sure. and start figuring out what you can figure out. But what are some of the, the challenges that you see customers running into right now as they're first starting or adopting Gen AI, what do you think some of the biggest hurdles are going to be that people will run into? Well, mm, there, there are quite a few, I would say. And uh, the first and foremost, I, I think, would be the data challenges. Uh, especially these models are trained on huge, large corpus of data, uh, you know, called through the internet. So they have a lot of good data as well as bad data, right? That means. We know, we go through Reddit, you'll see stuff and uh, all those things that it has been probably trained on. So high quality yeah. and a good quantity of data uh, is needed for these models to be much more reliable. And that will reduce any kind of errors, that will reduce any kind of hallucinations in these models. Of course, there are different techniques, as Travers mentioned, the rack is one approach where you're actually generating, but you are using your data set as, as a way to retrieve and, and provide that as a context and model to, to be much more relevant to reduce these kind of hallucinations. And there are often different approaches to do that. But in the essence, in short, you need to have quality good, high quality data to produce a reliable result, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the other ones that comes to mind, uh, which we are actually uh, quite focused on as well, is the, uh, the, the misinformation or the ethical concerns of it. So responsible AI, mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, from Amazon's perspective, it's, it's our North Star and we are really working towards that as well. And, quite heavily involved in that 
part two. So Gen AI's products and services using generative AI in some shape or form, we know that there could be concerns around deep fakes and misinformation. And with social right. media around, we know that how easy it is for misinformation to spread like wildfire pretty easily, right? So we have to be very careful and cognizant about that part. So these kind of harmful responses, we need to have special guardrails in place and safeguards in place uh, to make sure that these models are not used uh, for anything uh, uh, that we shouldn't be using it for, right? So uh, we have released a couple of these services to do, you know, these kind of guardrails on top of, you know, of course, the model providers are also making sure the models that they are making, uh, you know, has no biases or at least less biases and the data that they're fed right. on. So there are a lot of things happening from the model provider side as well. But from Amazon's side, we are also building a lot of our services, which allows these guardrails to be in place. One of the examples would be Amazon Titan image generator. So that's one of our language models, which uh, uh, uses to, you know, you can do text to image, uh, where we automatically embed the images generated by that model with invisible watermark so that we know that, well, you won't be able to see it with naked eye, but when you run it through the system, you would know that it was actually generated by a large language model. So that way you can stop the spreading of this misinformation. The other things, features like Amazon Guardrail is another one that we have introduced and which is in GA uh, now. You can stop any kind of prompt injection, jailbreaks, or any kind of, uh, you know, policies where you guardrail the model's output in such a way uh, that you don't allow the model to say something that it shouldn't be saying as an output. So those are the things Perfect. that we uh, have built as uh, as policies on top, like Godrail as one of them for sure. And we are continuously working towards this as well. And uh, I, I think it's a responsible for uh, everybody, not just the model providers or not just uh, providers like us, Amazon, but it's also the developers who are building this, even consumers, we all kind of equally share that responsibility as well to make sure these models are not used for any harmful uh, intentions and purposes. And I would say another one that comes to my mind is definitely the cost part of it and the return on yeah. investment part of it as well. Like, because it's one thing to run these models on POC, and it's another thing to run these models in a large scale in a production environment. And we have to weigh in those things as well because yeah, it can become expensive if, if you really have uh, yeah, heavyweight models running. Uh, doing the inference for you. So those are the things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would like to highlight the last part of the worksheet, part of the cost, because as Uri mentioned, you're going to have, I don't know, five, seven requests in a POC. But when you go into a scale, this is going to be thousands of requests. And those are not talking. You're right. So on that moment, the inferior cost, depending on even the model, will be uh, really impacting your business. So probably moving between models would be a good idea. Thinking about using some open models like a llama tree or going into production depending on the use case. So this is like a journey. So it's not like something that you start and you're going to finish in really short time. You need to keep evolving. And uh, as mentioned, you're going to start with product, augmenting the content, but then probably you're going to apply the guardrails doing the product the prompting depending on the model because the prompting okay. depending on the model will also modify the results. And uh, sometimes you are going to say, okay, but this was working in this different model and now it's not working. It's because of the prompting. So the prompting will be really helpful. And finally, when you are going to face in different models depending on the use case, probably you will need to also think about how to evaluate the model. So we also have a service to evaluate that model and define what's the best for you. And that evaluation, you can even have a human in the loop so that you can identify, okay, this is what really I am expecting for or versus the other one that wasn't performing as good as I thought in the PLC. So uh, gotcha. I would say this is really a long, well, it's a 
It's a journey. It's a journey. Journey, journey. journey yeah. I think, it is, is a journey the good word yeah. there to use for that. Yeah. So Debarshi, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on something you, you said very early. Like you've got to have good quality data, right? But you also have to have like enough quantity of data. Now, Correctly. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this selfishly and I think it's probably a question that a lot of people have is what if you, what if, what if you don't feel that you have enough data? Like, is that where something like a, a rag comes in? Like this is, my learning journey, my own personal learning journey. Like, let's say um, I have an idea that I want to build something to run through all of our statements of work to help the next person has to write that, to improve them, to add proper language, stuff like that. But let's say I don't have like 10 years worth of, of sows that I can feed into this. Is, is there still value for smaller organizations that then say, okay, is that where a knowledge base comes in where you sort of extend an LLM or is that a rag? Like, what would you do if you found yourself in that situation? You're, you're, you think you've got good quality data, but maybe you're not quite sure you have the quantity of data that would be sufficient to allow it to answer properly. Yeah. And that is fine, Brett. I mean, uh, and when I said good quality and quantity of data, as long as you're not building the model from scratch, if you're taking yeah, a model, right. which is already available. Yeah. Uh, we know, you know, most of the open source models, you will know their weights and biases and you will know what data they have been trained on. Right. Uh, but where the quality of the data comes into play is when you are asking the models a specific question, which is very specific to your organization, those kind of data the models will never have. Yeah. So that's right. when you find different architectures and approaches to feed the model with or augment the model with your set of data uh, so that the model understands the, uh, you know, your context, what you really mean by, hey, look into my, you know, uh, revenue investments and your app, I need, need to, you know, present or where I need to focus more or which product I need to focus on. Uh, because it, the revenue has grown. So those kind of data, if you're not a publicly traded company and such, you have those data, uh, you know, it, it would be hard for the model to predict. So that's why the model will start hallucinating because it might, it has never been trained on those data. Yeah. It has never seen your data before. So that's when your hallucination comes into play. But if you fine tune the model or use architectures like right. RAG in this case, and provide your set of data, then it becomes much more relevant. It, it yeah. understands the context. So that is very important for sure. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, a really important part to, to just highlight to folks that are unsure again, like, do I have enough data? Well, what you're really doing is to use that word that you, you use that's, I think, perfect. You're augmenting an existing model with your knowledge to help it uh, better understand sort of the context of the questions, I guess, and, and be more relevant information, right? To your point, if it doesn't know what you're passing it, it's going to hallucinate all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. And also right. that can be somehow managed uh, because you can say, hey, if you don't right. have enough information in the prompting, you will say, don't provide an answer or provide this default answer. Like it's, yeah. uh, I don't know, or I don't have the information. That's why the combination of data plus white rails and a uh, prompting, it's really yeah. needed. Yeah. The prompting thing there, yeah. Gerardo, is, is really important because some of the, the interesting demos I've seen and stuff is when people are, are working on an LLM and, and they ask it like, if you're unclear, mm -hmm. ask follow-up questions. And I think it's, it's pretty amazing right. to see the, the model come back and say, okay, yeah, I understand this, but answer these questions for me. And you're, you're really just adding context yeah. into that prompt. I, I think that's really interesting. It goes back to the importance yeah. of engineering those prompts well, right? Yeah. And yeah. I have seen, as you mentioned, a, before providing an answer, you can say validate that it is answer. It's a, good. So you're saying to the model, think again of, about your answer before providing the answer. And if you don't see information related to that answer, it, say, I don't have the information enough yeah. information. And exactly. you can see how the performance will <laughs> really improve in the, yeah, sure. in yeah. the prompt. Yeah. 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 It's almost yeah. like you're training a kid. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Much. My favorite, my favorite experiences are when you ask it a question, and you you know right off the bat, like okay, that's not right, right? And there, there's been a couple of times where I'm like, I I you know I've been experimenting a lot and you know pointing at our content and stuff, and I'm like, tell me 
I'll read this and, and tell me about the service. And I, I won't tell you exactly which of our services, but it came back and told us it was um, for managing satellites. And I'm like, hey, that's really cool. <laughs> um, but that's clearly wrong. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's clearly Maybe that's wrong. An idea, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an idea. I'm like, that's clearly wrong. Go back and check. And it's like, it's oh yes, good. sorry, I've re, I've <laughs> re it. It's, it's this is actually what it is. And the second time yeah. around, okay. I'm like, okay, now it at least seems uh, reasonable or or possible versus managing satellites. Um, but anyways, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, trust but verify. But, but yeah. <laughs> So here's the thing, like, I mean, uh, Bedrock, we released this uh, feature called Knowledge Base. So creating a model, a rag-based model, uh, you know, having that entire framework end-to-end, -end, uh, you have, you know, frameworks like Langchain and Llama Index and so, sort of others as well that you can leverage to build those kind of systems. Uh, but Knowledge Base actually abstracts even that from you. So it allows you to put in your data into S3 or some other sources. It does the embedding for you, which is, you know, taking these uh, words that you have, your, you know, all the information that you have, tokenize them, embed them in a vector database. And during the retrieval process, you are invoking the knowledge base and here and knowledge and right. it's taking your prompt and then, you know, querying that, uh, you know, vector DB to get that information relevant information and providing that for you. So knowledge base actually abstracts so I mean, a lot of those complexity to build these kind of uh, solutions as well. So you, should, you definitely should look into it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It's so interesting, the variety amongst all these models and the impact of prompt engineering can have. It's kind of a brave new world of it just work, right? Uh, it's really interesting that there's uh, and security too. Like the impact of uh, those guardrails is going to be huge because who knows what exactly is going to uh, happen once you expose this to the field. Um, yeah, it, 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 there's so many models. In fact, it kind of makes you wonder what's the best place to uh, to get started. I know we've talked a lot about Bedrock. Is that what you guys would recommend, or what do you well, think? Uh, well, even before you know getting uh, into the tools, and you know, I would say. You know, AWS Skill Builder. It's a great place to start your journey. Oh, yeah. You know, we have already curated a lot of these, uh, you know, learning paths. If you come from the business background, if you come from the business background, depending on where you are. So you can go through those learning paths on AWS Skill Builder, look it up. Uh, you have uh, free options available. You have monthly subscription available as well. And we have a couple of courses available in Coursera as well. I think one of our colleagues, uh, Mike Chambers, Angie Bird, they all created uh, generative AI with large language models on Coursera, with, along with the deep learning uh, team. And uh, and additionally, you know, uh, we as SA Solution Architects, we do various immersion days, game days, hackathon, uh, in-person training, virtual session, pretty much across every cities along pretty much globally, right? So look out for those, join right. us and, you know, build together. Let's build together. I, I think uh, we are in a brave new world with uh, new things happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, <laughs> yeah. And I love also that the uh, training is really, really good. And for those people who want to really have fun, hands on and play with something, they can start with a, an app, AI app building playground called Play, uh, okay. Party Rock. So Party Rock, you don't need to have an AWS subscription. You can only go into the web, search for Party Rock, and in just few steps, you can start creating uh, different applications to experiment with gener generative AI. For example, you could do, build your uh, playlist if you want to do a playlist or check based on your uh, refrigerator awesome. The best for you in the weekend, so you can start playing a, a lot, and this is really something that anyone can do. That yeah, I I I love. Um, actually, let me back up for a second. I've shared a couple links. So, Dorshi, you mentioned Skill Builder. Yeah. The amount of forget Gen AI. I know we're talking about Gen AI, but if you're just trying to learn about AWS in general, like there's got to be, I don't know. Thousands of things to spend your time on yeah. completely for free. It just, yeah. It's mind-blowing to me. So every time uh, we teach an AWS class or whatever, we kick people back to Skill Builder because 
there's only so Absolutely. much you can jam into your head in a eight hour session, right? And then it's it's kind of up to you to then go and yeah. continue to learn and, and skill builder is great for that. I also shared yeah. the Coursera uh, uh, nice. course that you mentioned. Thank I you, think I'm going to sign up for that myself. Um, I, I had a quick look at it and I'm like, wow, that's that thing is looks really good. And I think it's free. You can do it for free too, can't you? Yeah, it is free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, it is free. You know, what's wow. the harm of that? And then finally, Gerardo, you mentioned Party Rock. And along with Party Rock, I'm going to share here. Did I get the right link? I think I got the right link. I'm going to share every Thursday. Okay, here's a here's a plug for AWS. And, and speaking about learning, and we're broadcasting on Twitch. My favorite show, I actually work my Thursday calendar around an AWS uh, stream called Build On. And Thursday afternoons, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern. And they did not too long ago uh, a party rock thing. And Gerardo, your idea of not needing to kind of know the 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 underlying complexities, but just kind of see what you can build. They built during the session. It was one one of the the the, the funniest sessions I've seen them do. They built a, a bot that would read AWS news updates, but turn like slang on so it was like uh, uh australian nice. slang because i can see the person that was the the co-host i i cannot remember her name but no. australian so she was using australian slang and some of the fun they were having with this thing so it's a great way to kind of in a in an environment that you know you don't have to worry about breaking anything you can kind of just go out and have some fun it's 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 really really interesting so i shared that link nice. i'll make sure i put it in the show notes as well so those are all great suggestions yeah. Get out there and just build some stuff is really what this comes down exactly. to, right? Get your hands yeah, dirty and yeah, build things, see what happens. Very good. Exactly. That's good. Well, Taborshi, Harardu, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been great. Um, usually now, uh, do you have anything you guys want to share or? Yeah, usually we end what? the show guys with like any events or anything like that that might be coming up right. that you think are interesting and people should know about. Well, from my side, I would like to say thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Curious Orbit. Thank you, Brad Travers, uh, for having us today. And and it was uh, great, uh, you know, talking, having this conversation and what's going on on the generative AI side. Uh, I, I think uh, it was a lot of fun catching up. And uh, I I hope our viewers enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the session as well. Uh, feel free to, you know, uh, message us, include us, uh, you know, connect with us on LinkedIn and, and, uh, until next time, keep on building. Yeah. And I think I'm sure Ferrari might have some events coming up, uh, which, uh, you might be excited to share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. So if I able to do a shameless look also, and first, thank you so much, Fred and drivers for the invitation. It was really cool to have been here with you and the Borshim and, a. Uh, we also in AWS launch in December, uh, the new region in Canada West. So uh, start mm. learning about that. So for Canadian companies, uh, they now can have their use cases uh, only in Canada, and they can start learning about uh, those use the resiliency use cases, how they can uh, meet their requirement and start using them. Yeah. So now you can build yeah. full multi-region solutions with never leaving Canada. Yeah, even disaster recovery. Yeah, 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 even disaster recovery. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Great um, case, yeah. I I do have a couple things I want to share here as as we end. I I've already booked my calendar because what always happens, I joke okay. with Karen about this. I I swear it's like some sort of weird irrational conspiracy theory in my head. Every time there's a Every time there's an AWS event, I get booked in customer training. So I've already booked <laughs> my my day off, uh, no training for, I can't remember the date now. It's in September, I think it is, uh, the Toronto Summit. So September feels like a long ways away, but it's probably going to sneak up on us Stop pretty it. quickly. Nice. Yeah, so uh, I definitely will be there. I know Travers will be there. Uh, are you guys planning on, uh, Gerardo, Deborah, she'll yep. be there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll be there. Yeah, yeah, so the that'll be good. It depends. September 11, as you mentioned. Yeah, and yeah, usually really filled really quick. So I'll yeah, try yeah. to have the place over, invitation, and bother. Yeah, yeah. And then one real big shameless plug here as we wrap up. 
One of the things that Travers and I wanted to do, and, and I think it lines up well with sort of the things that we've been talking about here is just, you know, people starting to learn about this, where they're going to actually kind of know where to start. So what we've done is we've come up right. with a, a series of uh, webinars, unlike what we've done today where registration isn't required, you just show up on Twitch. Uh, we, we do have some registration for this, so you can scan that QR code. The first session of this will be on May 30th. Uh, we're going to do a 1 p.m. Eastern. And it is a, it's a 100 level thing. It's a beginner's guide. So if you're already an expert at this, this isn't uh, for you, but it's really to introduce the basics of Gen AI, look at the different uh, services that are available, kind of dive into some of the things we've talked about today, do some demos just to kind of help, you know, new things can sometimes be scary and uh, it can be overwhelming to know where to start. So sure. uh, we've come up with this and yes, I did generate the background for this view using uh, Gen AI. I didn't use Titan. Uh, it just it just wasn't giving me what I wanted, so I had to use something else to do that. But uh, here here's here's something. We forgive you. Use. Yeah, yeah, I get my mulligan right. No water, Mark. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I, I've really appreciated it, and we'll we'll do this again in the future as we have more to talk about on some demos and stuff like that with Gen AI, maybe some, some real life case studies with, with customers yeah. that we've helped build stuff with. So that would be cool. Yeah. Thanks again. And uh, awesome. Travers, any, anything to wrap us up or are we done? I think we're done. We're done. I think that's it. Perfect. <laughs> well, well, thanks again, weekend, folks. Boys. Yeah. Enjoy your weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. Bye. -bye. All right.